Hey, Woodside family, Pastor Chris here. I hope you guys are doing well. Welcome to another exciting edition of The Link. You know, we have been trying to tackle topics here on The Link that live at the intersection of faith and culture, literally applying the word of God to the way we live our everyday lives. Well, right now, the big conversation happening in all of our lives surrounds reopening, the reopening not only of our country, but our everyday lives, and yes, even our churches. And who would have thought that a moment we were all hoping for will be marked by so much complexity and even controversy. So how do we navigate th through this with grace and love for one another? And is there a way for us to take a moment that has divided so many and turn it into an opportunity to demonstrate the power of Christ in us? Today, we're gonna have a reopening conversation. We're gonna talk about reopening our lives and the values that should shape reopening our churches. And I'm so grateful to have some men of God who I respect tremendously that know you love as well. Joining me today is Pastor Doug Schmidt. Now, you guys know for 28 years, Pastor Doug led Woodside. Now he leads out a ministry called Barnabas that cares for the souls of pastors. Also joining me is Dr. Eric Moore. He's a professor at Moody Theological Seminary, as well as the senior pastor of Tree of Life Bible Fellowship. So grateful for him. And then Pastor Steve Zarelli, who's a senior executive pastor here at Woodside overseeing our campusing. I'm so grateful to have these men joining me today to help to shepherd our souls, to take what is a difficult moment and turn it into an opportunity for us to show the love and the life of Christ. Well, brothers, I appreciate you, uh, you joining me and carving out this time. I respect and appreciate each one of you a ton, both because of your love for scripture and your love for the Lord, as well as your love for his people and for reaching the world with the gospel. And so this has been uh, a, a unique time. I've run out of adjectives to describe this time. Unprecedented. Many have, have uh, referred to it as uh, stressful is what I often use. Uh, I've been through a lot of seminary courses, nothing on pastoring through a pandemic that I took in in, uh, in seminary. But Pastor Doug, you're in a season where you can kind of speak openly and honestly on behalf of all of us pastors, right? And so you've been working with a lot of pastors in this season. Can you just share what you've heard from pastors who are trying to shepherd through this season about the unique challenges and opportunities? Thank you for the opportunity to be on here, Pastor Chris. I've met uh, with three pastor groups this week, uh, actually four, uh, but uh, one, one this morning. And I think if there's one word that describes them, it's weary. They're just weary. Um, one uh, national author said it's like pastors are tired souls right now. And another article came out just a few days ago, uh, basically not predicting but warning that we're coming up to a pastoral collapse because of several reasons. I can give you some of them that have caused the pastors to be overloaded. One of them, they're serving in ways that they've had no training or experience. They're doing their best, but they're not, not able to keep up. They're concerned about some ministries that have started and will, will not be able to restart. Uh, they're exhausted. The less meeting doesn't mean less work. In fact, all of the pastors that Pastor Anderson and I, along with our mentors, are working with, every one of them is working harder than they were before. They're not feeding their souls. Their future is cloudy. Uh, the collapse of the job and financial markets impacts the churches. And their pastors are not physically healthy at this point. They have conformed to a seven-day work week. And um, some of them have have planned vacations and um, even sabbaticals, uh, and those are getting delayed. They don't want to go away. Uh, they're not willing to take time off. They don't. They don't seek mental health uh, help, um, and so they're in very, very dangerous spiritual territory. I haven't heard one complaint yet from a pastor. I feel, I feel the heaviness. Uh, on their hearts and in their voices, and you can see it in their eyes. They're just, um, they're tired of Zoom meetings. Their people are tired of looking at screens, and they're, they're just really exhausted physically, emotionally, and I think spiritually, they're on the edge. 
You know, we could do a whole show, gentlemen, just on care for pastors, for the soul care pastors. I think everything that Pastor Doug is saying, not only could we say amen to, but we've experienced it firsthand. And to our Woodside family, and even those friends beyond Woodside, I would say, please listen to Pastor Doug's words, because this should drive and motivate your prayer uh, for your pastors, uh, how you partner together uh, with them. Obviously, there's no way to avoid a lot of the heaviness of this moment, but we sure can encourage one another and uh, and pray for one another. And I appreciate Pastor Doug, the work that you and Pastor Anderson are doing with pastors all over this region, because we need our players to stay in the game if we have any hope of being able to win. But part of the stress of this moment, at least the complexities, Dr. Moore, is that now we have to face reopening. It was one thing uh, two months ago when we were asked to pivot overnight to online ministry, but now we are approaching a moment that honestly I thought was going to be more joyful. Uh, maybe I was naive in thinking that, but it's become a very controversial and complex issue to open, not to open, to require masks, not to require masks. But before we get into the actual specifics of reopening, can you talk about the values as a pastor that drive your processing of this decision? Sure. Thanks. Thanks a lot, Chris, for inviting me and allowing me to be a, a part of this. Uh, first, I want to say I think Pastor Doug has been uh, he's got a camera on me or something because my the, the, the bags under my eyes have grown in the last last two months. Uh, and so one of the things uh, that has been um, I've been reminding myself by and I've, I've been asked to, to speak at a couple of different uh, forums is James says to count it all joy uh, when you run into various trials. And um, I have to make the decision every day uh, to count it as joy. Now, I'm not counting as joy the pandemic or the COVID-19 situation, but I count it joy as what God is doing in my soul. Right, God is developing me uh, through any crisis. Uh, God is trying to perfect us and mature us. And so I constantly remind myself, okay, Lord, you are doing something in me. And you're not only just doing something in me, but you're doing something in my congregation as well, and also the body of Christ. So that's one of the values of the principles um, I try to operate by. The, the second one is, is that I need to operate out of faith and not fear. Um, Right. Ultimately, and I mean, this might sound cold, uh, but I, I tell my congregation this all the time. We're all going to die of something. So uh, not that I want to, to die of COVID-19 and not that I'm going to do anything that's going to tempt God or put myself in a situation or my family in a situation where we would contract it. Uh, but at the same token, I don't want to just be operating out of fear. I have to believe that God is with us uh, in the midst of this. God knows our trials. He knows we have to work. We have to do things that are not in our wheelhouse. And so I need to operate out of, out of faith. And then the other thing is out of concern for my, my neighbor and especially my church, church family, right? I, I need to be concerned about them. And so there's this balance. And I, I would agree, there is a tension between operating in faith and concern but I think that's where we just have to live. We have to live in this tension, realizing that sometimes, moment by moment, we believe the Holy Spirit is real. We believe the Holy Spirit prompts and leads. And, and, and in some situations, I may need to act. In other situations, I need to be cautious. And I, I think each pastor has to be tuned into the Spirit of God to know what he is supposed to do at the moment. Yeah, and I think that what you're describing, Dr. Moore, are not only pastoral values, but they're values that every believer uh, needs to embrace and, and live out in this moment. This thinking about the other, this uh, counting it all joy, uh, living in a faith-filled life, trusting that our God is able to, uh, to keep us, and being in tune with the Spirit. And I just want to encourage the Woodside family to pray and cultivate these values in your heart, because honestly, there's no handbook for a moment like this beyond the wisdom of Scripture in how we as believers ought to live in all seasons and at all times. You know, Pastor Steve, you and I get a chance to work shoulder to shoulder 
Uh, Pastor Doug talks about that Zoom fatigue. We've uh, shared in that joy together as we've tried to uh, think through this. And honestly, Pastor Steve, you've seen it. This can become a very insular conversation. And there's a part of it that should be internal. We have a church family that we love, and we got to think about what's best for them. That's why we did our survey. But then there's the opportunities that exist for witness. I want you to just share your heart because I know your passion for mission and for the church to live on mission. So just encourage uh, the Woodside family concerning uh, the mission opportunities we have in front of us. Yeah, thank you so much, Pastor Chris. I, as I think about that particular question, you know, I just always go back to the concept that the church is meant to gather for worship and scatter for mission. And so you hear so much, I've heard so much, and there's so many articles and conversations happening around how people miss time in the temple, time in the church, time together in worship. And that's a beautiful, powerful thing. And we ought to miss that. And I'm really hopeful, I think, with a lot of other pastors that this really awakened the souls of people towards the beauty of congregational worship, that, that it is a gift of grace that we're able to gather together and worship God, hear from the word, practice the sacraments, all of those amazing things in the context of community. And yet at the same time, this has given us this wonderful forced scattering into mission. And when you think about the New Testament church, it certainly had this idea. We use the church so often to refer to a place. And we've talked about this many times as a staff, and I know other people have as well. The church is ultimately a people. And so it's not that we're returning to church. That's congregationally how we gather in larger numbers, but we can also have church expressions on a smaller scale with other believers, even within our homes. And so the, the concept of not just being uh, looking forward to, I guess, that time when we can gather at the temple, but also just having that passion for what does the church look like in our homes during this season? And that opportunity for a mission in that space, beginning with our families, beginning with our marriages, beginning with our children, if we have some, beginning with all the people that we're seeing uh, because they're forced into the same kind of context we are. They're in their homes. And so we see them out on walks. We see them if we're in a vertical neighborhood, an apartment complex or condos or whatever it might be, they're all around us. And so taking advantage of those opportunities to demonstrate the gospel and to think about the church with the same kind of passion that we do of the gathering, thinking about that with the scattering as well. So what does it look like for us then to fill our lives with truly the fruit of the spirit, uh, not just in collective worship, but in missional scattering so that we are people that can be um, understood by our neighbors to be full of love and full of joy and full of peace and patience and to have a sense of calm that you just don't see in our culture right now, uh, to demonstrate that kind of behavior with others. And as we do that in the context of relationship, uh, God's going to move. He has been moving, and I know he'll continue to. So I think it's an incredible time, an incredible opportunity where we have people around us consistently uh, that we can meet, that we can love, that we can care for, that we can invite, even as some of these restrictions begin to lift, into our uh, churches uh, that are just within our homes uh, until we all come back together to gather again. You know, someone uh, may, may uh, be tempted to think that somehow we're in exile. We're not. We're in the land of opportunity. I know it feels that way, but we had to shake off that mindset. You know, people often ask me, how many locations does Woodside have? And I know what they want me to say. They want me to uh, count out our church buildings in various cities uh, and to say, well, we got 14 locations. But the truth of the matter is, is we have thousands of locations because every home is a place of sanctuary, of gathering. And I love this illustration Dr. Tony Evans uses. He says, you know, our large group Sunday public gatherings are like football huddles. You know, it's when the football team gets together and they huddle together. But never mis mistake the huddle for the play. The play is when we break the huddle and we go out into a watching world with the gospel of Jesus Christ to reach those who are lost and who are in need of healing and hope and encouragement that only comes to Christ. And so praise God for the holy huddles. We want to have those huddles again, but we don't want to mistake that for the play. We're getting a chance to run the plays right now. So 
uh, I kind of deputized the, the homes of Woodside as uh, these uh, sanctuaries for gathering as we go into the next phase. And probably for us, the next phase won't be, hey, let's go from quarantining at home to a large group gathering. It will be, let's go from quarantine individually to now having uh, watch groups and bringing, opening up your home and bringing your family and friends together, uh, connecting with your life group. We need to start connecting that way again as we move towards uh, larger group gatherings. Pastor Doug, this conversation though is more than just about reopening church buildings. It's about reopening our lives. So I would love for you to give some wisdom to the Woodside family, to our friends that are watching about what this next season should mean to them as they think about kind of getting back to normal. Well, I think every trial that we're in is there either to correct us or perfect us. And the disciples were sent out to see, they were ordered to go into the sea in Matthew 14. Um, we're in this trial in the same hand that stills the storm, you know, allows the storm. So God has us here for a reason. I think we would be very foolish if we just look at, I got to get through this rather than how can I grow through this? How am I going to be different um, when it ends than I was at the beginning? And so, because I think the world that we're going to enter into is going to call on Christ-like uh, believers um, I, we're going we're gonna to enter in a world that's uh, divided, super divided. And many of the pastors I work with see this in their own churches. They, they have the extremes in their churches, and they're saying to me, uh, how can we have unity? How can we bring this unity about? And the answer is the same now as it was three months ago. That which unites us has to be the person, the work, and the mission of the Lord Jesus Christ. Everything else is secondary. So I think it demands that we show high levels of deference as we come out of this. I think it demands we show uh, extreme patience. I think it demands that we're more intentional about sharing the gospel of Jesus uh, because another storm is going to come and another one after that. And we have to be ready. And ultimately, uh, there's going to be a day coming when um, it's over. And we got to look at those people around us, as Pastor Steve said, and say, where are they going to spend eternity? So we got to come out of this storm controlled by the Spirit of God and on mission with a new sense of urgency to share the gospel. You know, Pastor Doug brings up this divisiveness that you feel within the church. Uh, Eric, I, I would love for you to respond to this. We did the survey of our church family. You, you may have done the same. Uh, but we did a survey of our church family. And while most people, I think, are kind of in the middle of saying, hey, I'm going to trust leadership, there is on either extreme those who say, I want you to open yesterday, and I want you to do it with no restrictions at all. And then on the other extreme are those who say, hey, I don't want you to open anytime soon. And when you do, there better be a ton of safety precautionary restrictions in place. These two groups, very passionate, but are a part of the same church family, uh, serve the same Lord. So how do we avoid, uh, Dr. Moore, uh, this becoming a, a time of division? How do we maintain the unity uh, in the church? Well, first I wanna thank you for giving me that easy question. <laughs> I knew you could handle it. <laughs> but it really comes down to Christ and our love for him. Uh, we did a survey to uh, Chris as well, and it pretty much falls in line with what you've, you, you've said. There are a number of people who are in the middle, but there are some that I'm not coming back unless there are several precautions in place and others are we're ready to get back as soon as possible. Really, what's taking so long? I think we'll probably even find that among different churches as well, that there'll be some churches that will have a tendency to say, oh, those guys, they don't care about their people. And so look at them. They're just opening back up. And others will look back and say, oh, well, those people that are waiting, they, they don't have faith. They need to step forward. They're, uh, they're not living out uh, what they say they believe. Um, we, we know that's not true. That's, that's not true. 
And I think what we have to do is we have to give one another the benefit of the doubt. We, we have to uh, stop criticizing one another. You know, one of the reasons I, I, I spoke to James is because I'm just, I'm studying James right now. And one of the things James says is uh, to stop complaining against one another when you're, when you're in the midst of the trial. You, 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 instead of realizing that God is allowing this, uh, what, whatever your theology is, whether God sent it or God is allowing it, whatever, we, we do know that God is allowing it to happen. And God is allowing trials in our life because he is, he is perfecting us. He, as, as Pastor Doug says, he's either correcting us or maturing us or whatever, but it's something that we're supposed to get out of this situation. And if we realize that, then we can realize that God is working in one person's life different than he's working in my life and give one another the benefit of the doubt in love. And, and we have to trust, we have to trust that our leadership is in prayer, in God's word, is being led by the spirit, and is going to do what they believe is best for their local congregation. You know, uh, we, we, we talked a little bit, uh, Pastor Chris, about just the different dynamics between uh, what's happening maybe in the suburbs versus what's happening in the city. And so maybe maybe a church in the city or maybe even one of your locations in the city that's getting hit hard by COVID-19 says, hey, we, we don't feel comfortable right now opening back up. But we, you know, but we, we support what the other campuses are doing. Uh, some of the other campuses might take the lead on it, but we have to realize that, as has been said before, we are all living on mission for God, and God deals with different locales, different churches in different ways, and we just have to believe that God is working out his purpose in his way. Yeah, I love what you're saying, Dr. Moore, and it causes me to think of Acts chapter 6. Here, the early church in its infancy stage could have been divided over this distribution uh, of, of food and resources to the widows. And, and yet the apostles through prayer, through their commitment to the word, under the leadership of the Holy Spirit, they were able to uh, think through a solution and help to hold the church together. This is what leaders are called to do. And I do want to say uh, to the Woodside family that if we're going to model for a watching world the difference that Christ makes, we need to strive to create grace-filled environments, environments in which we are able to show the love of Christ uh, among different opinions, uh, again, reminding ourselves that this isn't a litmus test for salvation. Uh, whether you open today or next month is not going to determine your salvation. I know that's hard to hear. To wear a mask or not to wear a mask is not a point of heresy or essential Christian doctrine. And so what we have to do, and this is not to minimize it, is to be able to say, how do we think through a way where graciously we can hold the family together and yet accommodate those who uh, have varying opinions? You know, in our survey, Dr. Moore, we had over 60% live it over, say they were ready to come back right away. But yet 45% of our church family said, Either they have pre-existing conditions themselves or they're caregiving for someone who has those pre-existing conditions. So I think we need to make sure that we're thinking about all of God's people and not just creating an environment that accommodates uh, one group. And I appreciate your heart towards that. Uh, Pastor Steve, one of the things that was really encouraging about the Woodside survey that we did of our church family were the number of people who were willing to be inconvenienced. Uh, in this season, if it meant that it uh, created an environment where all could come. Some said, I'll sit in an overflow room if I need to, if that helps with social distancing. Others said, I'll come to a different time than what I'm normally uh, used to coming to. Uh, how did that make you feel seeing those numbers? And uh, why is that important for us to have that flexibility? Yeah, I think we have to in order to love one another well. Um, so, you know, to love your neighbor uh, is obviously to move beyond self and move into selflessness. And so, you know, if we're going to love one another well, if we're going to represent a different way to the world, uh, the world is used to seeing people at odds at these two extremes that Dr. Moore and Pastor Doug and all of us are really talking about. So they're used to seeing that. They're used to seeing all the arguments and the factions and the division 
but to actually demonstrate a different way, to demonstrate the gospel to them. It's so important that as a church, as a Woodside Church family, and for every church uh, during this time, that we show what selfless love actually looks like. Uh, love that is, as we've talked about here, that really demonstrates the fruit of the Spirit, it demonstrates the truth of the gospel, and it's self-sacrificial in nature. And that's what actually makes us so unusual uh, when we demonstrate that type of life to others. And so when we just look at one another and say, hey, this is my preference, but then what does it mean to care for my brother, my sister, uh, those within our church family? then all those other preferences really ought to take a back seat. And so, you know, within our, within our surveys, I know that we have to care for one another well. We have to do what's wise. We have to demonstrate patience. We have to demonstrate good discernment. Uh, we want to follow health professionals and all of these things. At the same time, I think fundamentally, it goes back to some of those values that Dr. Moore was sharing, that we don't, that we don't fear, that we lead out with love, and that certainly we think of neighbor as all those around us, certainly those within our church family. Pastor Doug, I'm going to ask you to close this in prayer, but before I do, you know, for 28 years, you had the opportunity of uh, leading the Woodside family, and I get a chance to experience the blessing and benefit of that every day. Uh, we just have an incredible group of people here, and there's a lot of folks who are watching us that are friends of Woodside that are trying to figure this out. Uh, if you have one final word you wanted to say to the church, to believers about just uh, how we can maximize this moment for the gospel, before you pray, what encouragement would you give? Well, a number of things come to mind, Pastor Chris. I think, first of all, I would say to the church, support your leaders in prayer. Uh, pray for your pastors and uh, their uh, some of them are used to working five or six days a week. They're all working seven, and they see no end to it. They're tired. Pray for them, that they would have a, a refreshment from God, and they would take the time to take care of their own hearts. I think, secondly, I would say is uh, um, maximize this crisis for your own spiritual growth, to, to grow through it, to learn, um, to come out of it much more prepared to to minister, to be on mission for the Lord Jesus Christ. I think if we could do that um, by showing deference, by loving people, um, and by pushing forward with mission, it'd be we, we could maximize this. We know it's already happening. A uh, big part of our society is going to push back at the church. It's going to blame the church. It's going to second-guess the church on everything. And we have to make sure we don't respond in kind. We have to make sure that that they see that we're Christians by our love. And I think if we can do all of that, uh, we, can, we can make a big difference for the gospel. I appreciate that, Pastor Doug. Can you pray for us? I would love to. Our Father and our God, we're just so thankful to know that we're not alone in this. That while we have to practice social distancing, you don't. And you're near us, you're with us. Uh, we can never escape the presence of Jesus. And so, Father, I'm so thankful for that. I'm thankful, Father, that while we as pastors feel somewhat helpless during this time, we know that we're just under shepherds to a great shepherd who is ministering to his flock uh, in different ways here and around the world. And so, Father, I pray for the church that during this time, Lord, you would uh, work in our hearts and work in our lives, shape us by your spirit. Now, Father, may we, as, as Pastor Steve said, live uh, selflessly in order to, um, to love our brothers, to love the world, and to make a difference. And Father, I pray for uh, churches as they make those decisions about opening and, and, and trying to balance safety and, and, uh, and the gathering. Father, give real wisdom, and Lord, we'll thank you for it. May so many good spiritual things come from this time. And we'll thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, Woodside, I'm so grateful to have had this conversation. I hope it blessed you as much as it blessed me. These are complex issues. We could have obviously spent hours talking about what it means to reopen our lives 
and reopen in our churches. But I want you to avail yourself to a couple of resources that I believe will edify you even more. First, there's an article we've posted on our social media sites. It's available in the postscript here. All you have to do is click on it. It's from the Gospel Coalition. And it talks about how we can maintain unity in such a divisive time. I also want you to avail yourself to your campus pastors. In the next couple of days, we're going to be announcing the next phase of our reopening plan. And I'm so fired up and so excited about it. It's going to be announced by your campus pastor. So make sure you stay tuned to our social media platforms and make sure you stay tuned to the link. It's our desire to make sure we're talking about the issues that are important to your heart here on the link. So if you're talking about it around the dinner table or on social media, we're going to talk about it here from a distinctly biblical perspective. So make sure you stay tuned to the link and just know that we love you and we're praying for you. God bless and have a great day.